Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and uh, you're going to have a great treat because Jonathan Gray is usually on the first and third uh, Tuesdays of the month. will be on the next couple of weeks as well. We are into Chapter 21, I believe, of the a book, The Forbidden Secret. If you want to get the ebook, these are essential reading. If you want to understand Dr. Deagle and why we pursue not only science but the science of spirituality, and God is a God of order. Uh, I tell people, even if you're going to mind, it's going to think clearly about things. And I saw an interesting discussion earlier today about a Mr. Price, George Price, who actually was an atheist, when he put up this theory that he thought that people couldn't be, quote, natively good, uh, that it wasn't possible. So he actually worked out these equations, and, of course, the evolutionists believed this. He later on realized that he took God out of the equation and became a, quote, devout Christian, but eventually became so obsessed with the fact that he didn't think he could prove his equations wrong because now the atheistic uh, evolutionary community had absorbed these as a central dogma where no one else could prove his mathematical equations that genetic selection made people altruistic so their genes would be passed on. Uh, The fact is, what the Bible teaches, which is contradictory to any other religion on earth, is that man is only capable continually of evil, even if it looks good unless they have a personal relationship with the Most High God. So your soul is speaking to the Spirit of God that is in us. And so heaven is not something in the future, it's something now. Hell is something now. You just don't become evident of the licking flames of destruction that are coming your way. You don't have the full the full recompense of it uh, on you. But people don't grasp that. They don't realize that scientific discovery has to have the spiritual blinders taken off. Geopolitical decision making has to be with the blinders taken off, or you or you meet destruction. Just like we mentioned in the first hour with Theodore Shubat, that the ancient peoples that succumb to Islam, that are genetically Hebrews, are about to be annihilated by Israel, their ancient brother, uh, because they are believing in jihad and trying to wipe out the Jews. I mean, so ignorance and apostasy lead to destruction and death, not just of the person, but of entire nations. And it all comes back to the fact that you can only do good if you have a relationship with God. And people try to make it real complicated to be a believer. You did an interesting discussion for a gentleman who listens to this program, who likes the Nutramedical Report, but he couldn't understand, quote, the science of how the Creator God could be incarnate in flesh. And he wrote a 24-page report. Uh, tell us all about this encounter, because this, as we get into this, this chapter, I think it will be very appropriate. Uh, yes, I had a gentle email, a gentleman email me after the, the last uh, our last broadcast on on the subject you just mentioned, Doctor Bill. So I prepared for him a special report, um, and uh, uh, to me it's now it's a wonderful subject, and um, the the people who see the information that's available, I think common sense. I mean, we're all intelligent people. Common sense tells us once we see the facts that this this is right. Uh, there's no question about it. God it became one of us so that we could have the opportunity to have eternal life. But the, there's a whole lot involved. His law is involved. His love is involved. Um, our acceptance is part of this. It, it's all part of the big picture. We've, we're given free will. Um, we've abused it. We've cut ourselves off from the life giver. He loved us so much, he came down and became one of us and went through all where we had failed and then credited his successes against our failures and as a result the law still remains intact and we can still be forgiven and have eternal life. I guess yeah, that's so, in a nutshell. Yeah, in other words, what it basically, uh, when it says the Lord, and there are many hundreds of different names for the Lord in the Bible, what it really means is God becomes, to quote, the Lord of your life. It really is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Your soul, and most people think this is another thing that I think is another apostasy. Most people think they have an eternal soul. Your soul is not eternal until it gets fused with the Spirit of the Most High God. That's why the second death means the death of the soul. The soul can die. We're very mortal. We're, we're, we're very, definitely mortal. And, and we have mortal flesh and we all... To give us that eternal life. Yeah, even if our soul were to live a trillion years, it's still mortal. The fact is that your soul is not eternal until it is fused with the Spirit of the Most High God and becomes a new creature, an eternal being, that is like unto Jesus. As we see, it said, when I return, you shall be as I am. He's not talking about qualitatively differently or quantitatively. He's saying being identical. Literally, we will be, quote, the physical and the spiritual children of the Most High God because our spirit, which means our will and our soul, will have fused with the spirit of the Most High God into a new creature, a new type of being. 
That's what he, what God is doing. He is literally reproducing himself in us by our acceptance and will. And that's why it's considered the analogy is a marriage supper, the hoopah of God's grace over us, allowing us to become eternal ones. Not just a temporal being that's kind of an advanced life form on this planet, but an eternal being living in eternity. And not bored either. That's the other thing. Oh my gosh, if we live forever in heaven, it will be hell. No. Uh, if you lived on earth the way it is now, it would be hell because the world is a fallen place. In fact, I made this analysis that actuaries calculated that if you it could, it could make biological death impossible, the average person would only live 475 years uh, based on actuarial tables. And only one person in 10,000 would live 10,000 years, and only one in a billion would live a million years. Interesting, eh? Interesting, very interesting. Yeah. In other words, the world is a fallen state. I mean, you can, and we don't, and that's the current level of fallenness. If it gets more fallen, it makes the odds even worse. If you get a more violent universe, more violent wars, if you get cybernetics and all kinds of other horrors, uh, you make basically, it says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. But what God is saying is, I'm the Psalm 91 one. I'm the refuge. If you don't have a relationship with me, it doesn't matter how advanced your science are. You can control stars, like Mishu Kaku says. You can control the black hole of a galaxy. You can control the power of a cosmos. You still will fall and be destroyed. As a sentient being, without a relationship with the Creator, you are temporal, and you will be annihilated. That's just the facts, and God doesn't do it. He simply says, he holds out his hand and says, become as me, and learn of the ways of the Father. And if you do... You get to live forever. But that living forever starts today in the temporal world because this is the world of creation. Creation doesn't exist in heaven. People just think that creation exists in heaven. No. God exists in heaven. Creation is here and now. But he wants his will done on earth as it is in heaven, and we don't see that. We see evil being done, bad decisions being done because they have no relationship. So let's talk about these principles that you taught in this 24-page document before we get into this, because I think it's important. It's something that I feel that people keep on asking, and they they really, they even if they've gone to church for years, they really don't have what I call an organic faith. They don't have, they don't, they think it's in conflict with science. Like, oh, you must be crazy if you're that religious. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Bill, <clears throat> today we've got, I, I guess we're on to maybe my favorite prophecy in the whole Bible, and uh, it's the crown jewel of all prophecies. Right. And linked to it is a rabbi's curse. I, I will explain that in a moment. Yeah, I'd like you to do that. And tie it into this uh, 24-page document, because I know you can, you're a master of doing that. Well, in, in 1656, a dispute arose in Poland between some distinguished rabbis and a group of people who uh, had studied the book of Daniel and accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And it's actually a prophecy uh, of a 490-year period given to Daniel and identifying exactly when the Messiah was to come and suffer. Now, uh, the rabbis were so hard-pressed by the argument that this proved that Jesus, or Yeshua, was the Messiah, that this was embarrassing, so they broke up the discussion. And then the rabbis held a meeting. And as a result, they pronounced a curse upon any Jew who should attempt to work out the chronology found in this prophecy of Daniel. And their curse was this. May his bones and his memory rot, who shall attempt to number the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. Now, you heard about the rabbi that recently died over a couple of years ago, and within a year afterward, they were able to unseal his prophecy of the name of Messiah, and it was Yeshua. He also said in this prophecy, which is up on YouTube if people want to Google it, that the Messiah would not come until after the death of Ariel Sharon, and they wrongfully said that he had died, but he's in a vegetative state in Israel on life support. So... Jews are coming to this revelation. They're doing it with their logical brain, and they're also doing it supernaturally because God's visiting Muslims and Jews that are completely dyed in the wool, 100%, you know, Jews, and showing them that Messiah is Yeshua HaMashiach. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing thing that set of events that's taking place. Yeah. Back in a moment with more. BeforeUs.com, Jonathan Gray, amazing story. This is probably the most important chapter, chapter 21. Back in a moment. And uh, so let's continue in this remarkable book, and uh, maybe we'll get into some of these, t- these issues that were raised in this gentleman that want to know 
how God can inter- incarnate. And this is interesting, the background of the prophecy. Let's get uh, into this part of it now. Yes. Well, you know, when I first heard about the rabbi's curse, that set me on a, on a um, long, careful investigation. And I discovered that in Daniel 9, 24, the, the 24th verse of Daniel chapter 9, we are given the actual length of time from a confirmable, specified event in world history to the predicted year for Messiah to appear. So when I hear people saying the Messiah is coming soon or, or, or he hasn't appeared yet or, or he, he appeared in the, in the uh, second century or whatever, uh, this is the yardstick by which we can measure the truth of anyone's assertions. Right. Now, back in 586 BC, the Babylonian armies laid waste the land of Judea. They dragged its people into captivity and their capital city, Jerusalem, lay in ruins. About 70 years later, the Hebrew prophet Daniel, a captive in Babylon, was poring over a prophecy penned by an earlier prophet, Jeremiah, which stated that after 70 years of desolation, the captivity would come to an end. So Daniel confessed the wrongs of his people, which had brought that disaster upon them, and he prayed for a fulfillment of the prophecy for Jerusalem's restoration, and that it would not be delayed. And Daniel records that in response to his prayer, a heavenly messenger named Gabriel appeared to assure him that his people would return and Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And then the, the heavenly messenger gave a succession of events to occur in the future. And this included the time in Roman history when the Messiah would appear. Now... Uh, it's By the way, when this roughly was the, given, Rome was... the 24th was, verse and goes through to the 27th verse of Daniel chapter 9, a very wonderful prophecy. By the way, when these prophecies were given, Rome didn't exist as a backwater in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in central Italy. It was nothing. That is absolutely right. And yet uh, the, the fact of the Roman Empire was predicted uh, long before, in, in great detail actually, uh, to the prophet Daniel. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing is that this chapter follows a prophetic pattern. And uh, it, it deals with what it calls weeks, weeks of years. And uh, it's understood, numerous Jewish scholars are quite clear on the fact that this prophecy is speaking of weeks of years, in which every uh, week represents a period of seven years. And this is in harmony with the Bible's own explanation of prophetic time. Oh, I, I don't think we need to quote any scholars, but I could just give you, I could give you bucket loads of scholars who are agreed on this fact. It's a, it's a normal, normally understood fact that um, weeks of years are understood in the prophecy of Daniel here, sevens yeah. of years, and there were 70 of those, a total of 490 years, which Daniel yeah. was told regarding coming events. You also mentioned in your book that the Jews also agree on these same principles. In other words, they're mathematical principles that are that cross not only Christian. But theologically, it crosses to the Jews who understand these are principles that are that are absolutes. Yes, they're absolutes. That's true. Now, this prophecy uh, is interesting in that it deals with two subjects: the coming Messiah and the future events coming upon Jerusalem after Daniel's day. And there's a clear structure to this prophecy, and it's a structure that's quite common in uh, in Jewish writings, particularly in the Scripture, in the Bible. Now, I, I'm just going to give a quick overview before we go any further. In verse 25, we're told that, that at the end of 69 weeks, Messiah will appear, and that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, but under conditions of distress. After the 69 weeks, Messiah will die violently. And as as for Jerusalem, a desolated prince will come and destroy Jerusalem again. During the 70th week, Messiah will keep covenant with many people, and in the midst of it, he shall cause sacrifices to cease, because he'll be the final sacrifice. And as for Jerusalem, the desolator himself will be destroyed as predetermined. And you've got a a structure which is very common uh, in uh, the Torah, which is um, uh, balancing one fact against another fact and repeating and advancing that fact to its ultimate conclusion. So we have a, a succession of events relating to the Messiah, a succession of events relating to Jerusalem, and they're placed side by side and linked together because there is a link between them. 
very interesting prophecy. It really is. Now, it starts off by saying, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the decree or the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Jerusalem shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. Now, the, the seven weeks, which is a seven times seven, 49 years, was the length of time it would take to restore and rebuild the city. And then there would come a period beyond that in which the actual timing of the Messiah's appearance would take place. And history tells us that there was a threefold uh, attempt to activate this prophecy. Uh, Cyrus himself uh, is recorded as having been made aware that he was mentioned in the prophecies that he would be uh, giving a command to go and restore in Jerusalem. Right, but rebuild the this temple command was not fulfilled, and so it was reaffirmed by Darius and by a third uh, a, a Persian king, Artaxerxes. Right. And the three of them together constituted the final permission for the Jewish people to go back and rebuild the city. Amazing, isn't it? It is. It really is amazing. If we go to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we find that uh, the third decree was given in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, in the year 457 BC, and that gave Jerusalem its legal rebirth, and that restored full autonomy where they could legally uh, stand on their own again, and this included, of course, the ability to pass the death sentence. And this made possible the restoration of Jerusalem to capital city status and its rebuilding as a visible uh, administrative centre. And this decree is the one which the prophecy had in mind when it spoke of the decree to restore and rebuild. Not just to rebuild Jerusalem, the city, but to restore the, the Jerusalem's legal uh, status again. Exactly. Now, the, it also talks about that after the return of Messiah this time, that there will be a Jerusalem, so it won't be destroyed, but that, the, that, that all the nations, and there will be nations, it won't be a new world order where the nations are, don't exist anymore. So, there's yet future uh, things to happen. One of the things that personally happened was 24 years ago when I received clay and iron, which goes back to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is probably one of the most important books in the Old Testament because in a sense it's the center point of the questions asked by the book of Revelation. And it shows the power of God where he put the questions thousands of years later, right, or 800 years yes. later, and then he give the answers... Uh, in the book of Daniel, which is why, of course, the Jewish curse against actually studying it, because they knew it would point to who was the Messiah. It would also show that the Jews were literally working under a curse that not they, they didn't do others, they did to themselves by not accepting their Messiah. That's Amazing. Right. That's that hell of yeah. Amazing. Back in a moment, Jonathan Gray. discussion about uh, this uh, whole issue today and of course <clears throat> this uh, answer that you gave to this gentleman I'd like you to see to put together as another ebook because I'm just looking through the first part of it it looks very elegant very straightforward very amazing uh, so let's continue on your book on the chapter 21 the forbidden secret and the rabbi's curse Yes. Okay. If we if we forget about seventy weeks and call it four ninety years, and we've explained why that is, that is so, it's uh, seventy weeks of years, seventy sevens of years. The first forty nine years, starting with four fifty seven BC, which gave Jerusalem its legal rebirth. Forty nine years would elapse for the rebuilding of the city and the wall. Then there would be a remaining period of 483 years to Messiah's appearance. Now, altogether, we've got uh, actually 434 years after that, 
In other words, 49 years plus 434 years after Jerusalem is restored to Messiah the Prince. Now, the, the year 457 BC for the restoration of Jerusalem is substantiated and firmly fixed by four independent sources, and I, and I could sub supply these, the Greek Olympiad dates, Ptolemy's Canon, the Elephantine Papyri, and the Babylonian Cuneiform Tablets all establish that as the year in which this event took place, that Jerusalem was, uh, the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Right. Now, the fact that this is established in history beyond any disputable doubt means that the date of Messiah's appearance is likewise absolutely certain, according to this prophecy. Right. And that brings us to the year 27 AD, for the appearance of the Messiah. Now, what does Messiah mean? It means the Anointed One. Now, we have a, a record in the New Testament of a man called John the Baptist, as, as he was called, and he began preaching in the desert, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're told in the New Testament that, Luke records it, that the people were in expectation. Now, why were they in expectation? Because the prophecy of Daniel told them that the time was at hand, and John was just announcing it. And then there came down to the riverbank this young man, who was now of the age of, of rabbi teaching, around the age of 30, he came down to be baptized by John, and he was publicly announced at his baptism as the anointed one. In fact, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and anointed him, and uh, John said, Behold the Lamb of God. Here is the man that we've been waiting for. The time has arrived. The Messiah has appeared. What year would that and be? Here we have the announcement that the event had taken place. What, what year would this be now? You mentioned, uh, uh, I think it was, you said... The, the, this would be round about September, October in the year 27 AD. 27 years AD uh, after the birth, okay. That is right, yes. Uh, now, well, we know that the uh, our AD system was uh, was fixed on our calendar sometime later by a, a Roman chronologer who just got a few years out on the birth of Jesus, but that doesn't matter. The fact that we do know on our, on our present day reckoning that we would call that year the year 27 today. We call it year 27 rather than the year, say, 30. That is right. Yeah. And uh, at this time, Jesus began his public ministry by declaring... The time is fulfilled, and Mark records that, Mark 1.15. And so with his own lips, he announced the end of Daniel's prophetic time period. I'm here, he said, I'm on time. And uh, one in the crowd who'd been to the Jordan reported back to his brother, the fisherman Peter, we've found the Messiah, the Christ. And the term Christ, of course, is the English equivalent of the Greek Christos, the anointed one, and of the Hebrew Mashiach, Messiah. Yeah, and by the way, the, the, the term by Meshiach means not just one that's anointed, like a special person, like a king. It means one, because they knew that the name was going to be, and this was in the stars you mentioned before, Yahashua HaMashiach, which means the, the incarnation of the one that created everything in, dressed in human flesh. Yes, that is right. That's who he is. That's who he was. Right. And what year was this? Well, you know, not only is Daniel given the year, but we have wonderful historians, very careful historians writing parts of the New Testament. Luke was one of these. And uh, scholars who have been trained in the critical school have, have often attacked the, the Bible as not being historically true. And one of these men was Sir William Ramsey, one of the greatest archaeologists of all time. Now, he was a student in the German historical school of the mid-19th century, and he was firmly convinced that the New Testament book of Acts written by Luke was a fraudulent product of the mid-2nd century. And he began with this, with this unfavorable attitude toward it. But as he examined the historical statements, he suddenly had to do a turnaround and realize that Luke, as he called him later, is a historian of the first rank. His facts are trustworthy, and any honest critic will come to the same conclusion. Now, what Luke has said in, the, in his gospel is this. He says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, he gives us one check. 
Then he says, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, point two. And Herod being tetrarch of Etruria, point three. And of the region of Trachonitis, point four. And Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, point five. And Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, point six. Now, by putting all those together and comparing the years in which they would overlap, we come to the same conclusion, this was the year 27. And here we have a wonderful piece of evidence that the scripture gives us so that we can check for ourselves the very year when the Messiah did appear, proving that he fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel to the very letter. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, we could go on and, and give those, those historical facts, but we can find, if we take the time, which we won't do on air today, that I've put it in my book, so anyone who wants to check up on this in chapters 21 through to 23 uh, will find evidence plenty. Uh, these men who are mentioned here uh, are historical characters who were all ruling figures at the time Jesus was baptized, and the year, of course, gels perfectly. Okay, th there we have his appearance date. Then we're given a pe the remaining period of seven years, and that is that the covenant, he's the messenger of the covenant. Malachi says he's coming, he's the messenger of the covenant. And for one week he shall confirm, establish this covenant. And that is a period of seven years. Now, this is, what is this covenant? Well, the scripture tells us that the covenant the Messiah was coming to confirm was the covenant of mercy, the everlasting covenant, the promise of rescue that he had made with our first forefathers, given to Adam and Eve. And during his time on earth, and a period of seven years beginning from his appearance, the covenant would be forever established with many of Daniel's people, the Jews. And this divine covenant was going to triumph in the ministry of the Messiah and then in the ministry of those whom he had trained, the, the apostles. And uh, the, the covenant already existed. It was now simply to be confirmed, and he confirmed it by his appearance. Now, four annual Passovers occurred during Yeshua's public ministry between his baptism in September, October 27 AD and his death during the March, April 31 AD. It was framed by the Passover. His entire ministry wasn't. Was. Yes. So, so we have a total of three and a half years from, from September, October 27 to uh, March, April uh, 31 AD. And he confirmed the covenant in person by his life and teachings. And just before he went to the cross, he lifted up a cup of wine and said to his disciples, This is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when he spilled his blood, that confirmed the covenant beyond any doubt. The wow. agreement was now in place. In other words, there's no reason Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and Jonathan Gray, the Forbidden Secret, which you can obtain as an e-book. It's amazing. Uh, 624 pages, probably the most important book that you've published. And you have many books at beforeus.com, B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S.com. Let's continue with this. The, uh, this, of course, lays the groundwork for not just the first time coming, but the return of Yeshua HaMashiach, and he has to return people's hearts. There's a lot of two main reasons why people are confused now. Number one is they don't walk by faith, which means they have to walk by Spirit of the Most High God. They also don't believe the prophetic um, unveiling, unsealing, can occur at this time. They think the prophecy ended with Malachi, when in fact what you're doing today is using your intellect and the Spirit of God which moved you to unseal these things, which is literally the Daniel prophecy. So what we're talking about is the very fulfillment of what Daniel said, close up and seal the words of this book to the time of the end, and we're there. If anybody, yeah, even, yeah. even if you're an atheist and just a mathematician and you calculate out the odds of a great war occurring in the next decade, uh, looking at the just statistical, military, economic, and other factors, you'd be overwhelmed with the fact that our civilization is ready to crash and burn, let alone adding 
the galactic and cosmic and solar events that are about to happen to our planet, which are showing famine, drought, earthquake, volcanoes, and tsunamis like the El Hero. So when people think that they don't need God, let me tell you, you better get down your hands and knees if you don't believe in God and pray that your, your belief system suddenly gets an upgrade of, with spiritual software. Absolutely, and, and that's a challenge for every single one of us. Right. So let's continue, please. Uh, well, just before his death, uh, Jesus lifted up the cup of wine at the Last Supper and said to his disciples, This is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. He, he may have been thinking that night of Daniel's prophecy, which said that he would confirm the covenant with many. And to become effective, the covenant would require his death. And so we have a period of seven years, which is the final seven, is final week of the book of Daniel, chapter 9. This period of three and a half years of his own ministry would be followed by a second period of three and a half years, which would follow his death and which were definitely directed at the Jews, which Daniel was said that they'll be directed at by people. And uh, the New Testament writers bear witness that after Yeshua's death on the cross, the same covenant message was confirmed to the Jewish nation for another three and a half years. It began 50 days after the crucifixion on the day of Pentecost, when Peter called his countrymen to turn around and accept forgiveness. For the promise, he said, is to you and to your children. This is the promise of Daniel. And uh, Galatians, Paul writes, he says... The covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ. Luke adds and Mark that they went out, the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly as the disciples themselves uh, proclaimed the, the coming of the Messiah who had just died. And Mark says that the Lord was confirming the word with signs following. And Paul says it was confirmed to us by them that heard him. So this is how the Messiah would confirm the covenant with many, that is the Jews, for one week, seven years. First, in his own personal uh, ministry, and then after his resurrection, in the personal ministry of his disciples, which was simply a continuation of his ministry. And this was directed solely at the Jews, and the Gentiles were not included in this until the end of the 70 weeks. So there we have the, the 490 year period given to the Jewish people, starting with the uh, command to go and <clears throat> restore Jerusalem and then continuing with the appearance of the Messiah in AD 27 who would for three and a half years confirm the covenant then his disciples would for another three and a half years confirm the covenant and then the gospel to the Jewish nation as a nation only uh, without going to the Gentiles, would come to its end, and the ministry to the Gentiles would begin. And this is how Daniel predicted it. Yeah, and exactly. this is how it happened. It has happened. And, of course, right now we see the signs of the end. We see the gathering war in the Middle East and the fall of Syria that's pending. We see the gathering peace treaty. We see the Oslo Accord. We see everything lining up, including the Federation of Europe, with a super government because their debt cannot be repaired unless they become a federation. Mm. Everything is lining up for us toward the time of the end. And uh, people are not prepared for this. The average people, and the average, even in the churches, are not prepared to walk by faith through what's coming because it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be pleasant, and it's going to be very, how can I say, it'll divide families, it'll divide uh, brother and sister, father and son. It's going to be difficult. Yes, yes. Well, I would like to mention, say, that the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, Dr. Bill, is irrefutable proof, mathematical evidence, scientific evidence, that Yeshua was who he said he was. And he himself constantly appealed to the prophets as proof of his identity. And uh, when he was asked to prove whether he was the Messiah, he just didn't work a miracle to do it. He, he pointed to the prophecies and says, they testify of me. And in his life, the events uh, fulfilled more than 300 of those Old Testament prophecies. The, the specially beautiful one in my mind is this prophecy of Daniel, which pinpoints the precise year. Yeah, you also have to read in the book of John, uh, interesting comments you make about the 
fact that John himself confessed that he wasn't Messiah because the rabbis even went to him thinking he may have been the one who presumed to be the Messiah because the timing was right. Yes, that's true, but he said, no, I'm, it's not me. And he, he said, he who comes after me, I'm, I'm not worthy to undo his shoelaces. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, another factor, because the, the prophecy of Daniel 9 has two parallels. There's, there's the Messiah on one hand, and there's the, the history, the coming history of Jerusalem on the other hand. And uh, remember that Daniel said that the, uh, the command would go to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Yet, at the end of his prophecy, he said that after Messiah dies violently, after he is cut off, and, of course, he's referring there to a prophecy which is also found in uh, Isaiah, chapter 53, that the Messiah will be cut off out of the land of the living. And as a result of their rejection of him, Daniel says, A desolator will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary again. Now, of course, the sanctuary was the heart of the sacrificial system. Jesus himself had died. He was the final sacrifice. And so it was that in A.D. 70, ultimately, the city and temple were again destroyed. Judah lost her autonomy and national life. The scepter of ecclesiastical sway departed from Judah. The Jewish people were banished from the Holy Land as a result of the wars of 70 and 135 A.D. And for many centuries, they became a scattered people. Now, is this a coincidence? Not a chance. Daniel said the Messiah would die first and the temple would be destroyed again afterwards. Accidental coincidence is a mathematical impossibility, even when just a few of all the uh, many factors are taken into account. And I'd like to challenge any honest thinking person today who would still want to tell us that there was nothing above and beyond mere human power and calculation here that there's no potent presence of a mind that knows the end from the beginning. I tell you, the whole of this prophecy from the times and the corresponding events has been fulfilled to the very, very letter. Now, where does it point us to, to our current situation right now? Are there, lately, are there hints as to what uh, kinds of signs? Because I think it says in the Bible that no man knows the day or the hour, but in fact that points to not only a day and hour, but a moment when they set up the high priest in the tower to actually blow the shofar at the sign of the new, uh, of the new moon uh, at the time of the ceremonies because that's when their day began. Their day began actually not in the morning when the sun rose, but when the moon set in the sky at sundown. That's when the calendar, yeah. when the calendar day starts in the Jewish calendar. It's based on a lunar calendar. Uh, what are the signs we need to watch for as we see the fulfillment of this first thing happening and the second? I'm sorry, I didn't want to catch that. Are there any hints as to what kinds of signs to watch for? Well, there, there is a sign uh, Jesus did give in, in Luke chapter 21. He says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that desolation thereof is near. Exactly. And, of course, we see the rise of the Muslim caliphate from the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, and that's yes. happening as we speak right now. And we know that the statements by... Netanyahu and most people think well he's just a warmonger no he's actually pretty logical if, and he's already made the statement we talked about in the first hour with Theodore Shubat that if the Syrian government falls and the armaments and chemical weapons fall into the hands of the caliphate the Muslim Brotherhood we know that the time of trouble is started very very soon oh very very soon we're living in a, in a, at a dangerous moment before the big events start to break Amazing program today. Thank you. God bless. Check it out yourself.